All right, so in this podcast, we're going to start talking about reaction rates. We've talked about kinetics and kind of the speed of reactions a little bit and what can affect the reaction rates, but now we're actually going to start kind of calculating and comparing them. These notes are just on page six, so if we start at the top, what is a reaction rate? Well, this is pretty straightforward. Just like any rate, this is the change in the amount of a reactant or product over time. So change over time. Velocity and speed is change over displa of displacement over time. Here, because we're dealing with chemicals, this is going to be generally the concentration and molarity. That's what those square brackets mean of a reactant or product over time. So this expression, this rate of delta x, that triangle x over delta t, allows us to measure and compare how much our concentration of x changes and divide by the time taken for that change to occur and get, gives us the average or relative rate of the reaction over time. Hopefully it's pretty straightforward, even if you're just starting physics this year. Now, the rate expression can be written either in terms of a reactant or a product. If we take a very simple reaction where A is turning into B, the rate expression for a reactant like A would always be a negative value, a negative rate, because that A concentration is decreasing as the reaction occurs. The A is being used up, it's turning into B. Similarly, the rate expression for a product is always going to be a positive value because B and any other products are being produced, so the concentration is going to increase as the reaction occurs. Now, quick note, many of these concentration or many of these rates will be written in terms of concentration changes over time. But we can relate the rate in any kind of measurable quantity over time. There's lots of different ways we can do that by counting the number of bubbles produced over time, the amount of mass produced over time, or even using spectroscopy, like those colorimeters we've already seen and used to quantify the amount of color changing over time, which is proportional to concentration. But don't worry too much about where the rates come from and what exactly they're measuring. Oftentimes it is molarity over time, but if they don't specify molarity, it could be anything, and it's not really that important what those units are most of the time. So relative reaction rates are important, being able to compare different rates of different reactants and products to each other. Because a reaction always has at least two substances, so always more than one, and generally in AP chemistry, more than one reactant and product, you can write the rate expression based on any of these substances as long as you account for the difference in the stoichiometry of these substances. So I once again have a very simple reaction here where A and two Bs react to make three Cs. And I want you to look at this stoichiometry and think about which of our reactants, A or B, is going to be used up faster at a greater rate. Well, if we think about the rate this reaction is going, for every time this reaction happens, when one reaction happens, one A is used, two B is used. Even though it's not asking about products, three C is being produced. So if we think about these reactants, which one's being used up faster? Well, that's going to be B. It's being used two times faster because that two in front of it means every time the reaction happens once, every time one A is used, two Bs are used. So the, re the rate in terms of B is twice as fast as the rate of consumption of A. Now, if we want to relate these to each other, to make everything equal, the simplest way to obtain these relative rate expressions, to make all of these rates equal kind of to the rate of the reaction, is to put a 1 over the coefficient, basically to do the inverse of the coefficient from the balanced equation in front of the relative uh, rate change expression, where we have the change in some concentration of A, B, or C over time. And then make sure to double check and apply the appropriate plus or minus sign based on whether the substance is a reactant or a product. So using that kind of guideline, because it's understood to have a 1 in front of this A, then this is 1 over 1, which is just 1, of the change in concentration of A over the change in time. And we do have a negative sign here because A is a reactant, so it's being used up. And that rate of change of A is equal to half of the rate of change of B. Because B is moving twice as fast as A, 
the normal, just standard rate of A's disappearance is equal to 1 over 2, 1 half of the rate that B is changing, which is equal to the positive of 1 third of the rate of change of C. So this seems kind of backwards to some people that the bigger the numbers are, the smaller these ratios are, but keep in mind, because B is being used up twice as fast as A, if we're trying to set them equal to each other, then the rate of A being used is going to be equal to half of the rate of B being used. And so we can just set that up just as a standard, almost don't even have to think about it. Always do one over the coefficient from that reaction when we're setting these equal to each other. Now, if I told you something like, oh, the rate of production uh, or rate of uh, use of A is 2 molarity per second, you don't have to set up this whole relative rate expressions. You can just say, oh, well, B is going to be twice as fast as A, so that's going to be used up at 4 molarity per second, and C was going to be produced at 3 times that rate, which would mean it's being produced at 6 molarity per second. And technically, since these are being used up, those should be negative there. So if I give you one of the numbers, then we can always just do that math and follow those ratios here. But this is still true. The rate of change of A is equal to half of the rate of change of B. But you will oftentimes, occasionally, especially in the multiple choice section, be asked, like, which of the following is true about the relative rates? So these relative rate expressions, being able to set them equal to each other, is useful. Now, next thing, also pretty straightforward, self-explanatory, reading and finding rates from graph or data. The reaction rate is not necessarily constant throughout the reaction. So this is, graph is a pretty big old graph. You can see that the curves are not constant. They're not straight line curves. It often changes over time. So we can graph that change in concentration over time to allow us to get a better idea of the exact rate of the reaction at a specific time or in a specific range of time. To get what's called an instantaneous rate at a specific time, we could calculate the slope of a line tangent to the curve at a point, like that. what they've done here. They've chosen a point here, and they've drawn a tangent line here, which just touches the curve at the same slope of the curve at that point, and then we can take the slope of that, so rise over run, in order to calculate the instantaneous rate at that specific time. Now, that's not generally something that you're going to be asked to do. Oftentimes, what you're going to be given is data or the opportunity on a graph with some more lines on our y and our x uh, planes to find the average rate, where you're given a set amount of time where you can find specific points on that chart or specific uh, data in this uh, data table and subtract, find how much that concentration changes over a certain time frame, where we literally are calculating final minus initial x concentrations over the final minus initial time, con time frame to calculate that average rate over that time frame. So, these are all just kind of normal ways to find different slopes and whether it's a single point or an average point over a wider range, we can do that. So as an example, we've got two problems where we're finding average rates and we're going to use the data table to do this to get some nice exact numbers. If we're looking at the average rate of disappearance of NO2 in the first 100 seconds of the reaction, we need to look at the concentration in the first 100 seconds. So at 100 seconds, we're at 0 0.0065, and our initial concentration at 0 seconds is 0 0.1000. Our final time is 100 seconds, our initial time is 0 seconds. So if we do that subtraction, we end up with negative 0 0.0935 over 100. And this is negative, this is the, a reactant in this reaction. You can already see that negative slope in the graph. So NO2 is going away. If we finish this division, then our rate in terms of molarity per second is negative 0 0.000935 molarity per second. Now, if we want to do the same thing for the average rate of disappearance of NO2, but focusing on the last 100 seconds of the reaction, 
we want to look at that 400 and 300 rows. Our rate is equal to the final minus initial, so 0 0.0031 minus the 0 0.0038 at those specific times over our final time minus initial time, so 400 minus 300. When we do the math, that equals negative 0 0.0007 over 100, which is negative 0 0.0007 molarity per second. And this matches up with what we're seeing in that graph for our green curve, because this is leveling out some. It's starting at a much steeper slope with a greater change in concentration over time, and then leveling out as the reaction goes. Now, at the top of page 7, you have three problems that are going to just touch on these same ideas we've just talked on and worked on. So I want you to try these. These are not required uh, to be perfect, but I want to start class by having a conversation about these before we move in to the next topic in our packet. And the first problem, so part example A, there's no numbers or calculations. This is like what we were just starting with, the relative rates of reaction, comparing this, these three different substances' rates to each other, where you're using that inverse rule with our coefficients. So just set up those expressions here. B and C are calculations where you would have an actual value. B is an average rate using these numbers that I've given you. So use those numbers, and uh, you're going to have to calculate molarity, moles over liters, to find the molarity per second change. That should be pretty simple. And then what you're going to do in C is actually kind of put together what you did in B and A and actually look at the relative rate of change of O2 compared to N2O and take the number you calculated in B and see if you can use that to calculate a number for N2O in C. So like I said, we will start with this in class. No matter whether you got right or wrong, no one's going to be perfect, and we want to make sure we get the right ideas so I'll start here in class. But if you know you got it right, then uh, we can move through this faster. So hopefully that wasn't too bad.